You are listening to the Hiking Radio Network, where we talk the walk with shows by hikers, about hikers, for everybody. wondering what that is all about. When I first heard it, so did I. Don't worry, all will soon be revealed. Welcome to a slightly musical edition of Mighty Blue on the Appalachian Trail, sponsored by our friends at Trailtopia. Episode number 83's guest is Mike Carboneau, or Strummy Stick. That was Mike. I bet some of you thought it was me, didn't you? Go on, own up, you thought it was me. But no, it was Mike, and I invited him onto the show when he sent me some clips of him playing that twangy-sounding instrument, which, it turns out, is called a strumstick. For our interview, he sent me three specially recorded songs. You've just heard the first, the second will play at some point in our interview, in the background, and I'll be finishing the show today with his version, indeed an AT version, written by him, of the old Crow Medicine show's Wagon Wheel, originally written by Bob Dylan. I must admit, that's my favourite one. My wife's dulcet tones will return to introduce the show next week. After Mike, we're going to hear from Jared Ross about the exotically named Lost Coast Trail, a hike that sounds just as good as its name. Jared is also starting a podcast and he'll tell us about that as well after he enthralls us with the Lost Coast Trail. Before we get on to these goodies, let's have a bit of lunch. What do you say How about those days when you struggle through the morning, probably got 10 miles under your belt and breakfast is a distant memory? It's lunchtime and, yep, you could always have your full Snickers of the day for yet another sugar rush. But sitting there in an empty shelter, protected from the bitter wind, I'm sure you'd really rather have Trautopia's beef-flavoured ramen noodles with green beans, corn and mushrooms. De-flipping-licious. And if you need to go without the gluten... All of Trailtopia's ramen noodle lunches and light dinners are available gluten-free. Try Trailtopia Adventure Food, the best of home cooking away from home. So now, prepare to get a twang in your ear and a tap in your toe. Let's listen to Mike Carboneau. Okay, I would like to introduce a guy named Mike Carboneau or Strummy Stick on the trail. Hi Mike, how are you? Oh, doing fine, Mighty Blue. How about you? I'm good, thank you. And and Mike wrote to me a really interesting email, and uh, it was really to introduce what he does. And uh, and I I love to have section hikers on the trail. Mike is a section hiker, but he has one or two other things about him that uh, I think you're all going to be really interested in. So you're a section hiker. When did you actually start hiking on the AT then, Mike? Well, um, if you go back... When I was about 48, uh, probably right around 2000, uh-huh. I took a few trips up to the Whites. And, right. you know, I was one of those tourists that did the, um, that did the huts, you know, right. and I went up yeah. there and enjoyed that. Yeah. And, um, you know, AMC helped me out, you know, kind of eased me in. And then um, in 2004, when I was at one of the huts, Mizpah, which a lot of AT hikers go through, um, when I was at Mizpah, somebody mentioned the Vermont Long Trail. All right. And so I got myself excited about that. And in 2004, the year I turned 50, I went out and did the Long Trail. I was, uh, I was a school teacher, had the All summertime. Right. So I went and, um, you know, hopped on the Long Trail and did that. Uh, that was my first hike my first overnight hike you know in a tent that type wow of thing. that's that's quite something that's not a short hike is it either so you you also had your own midlife crisis then <laughs> at yeah, 50 years of age so, we all want know? to do something don't I we i mean everything was cruising along well you know like my my regular uh you know family world and career and everything was going along sure. well but i don't know there was something when i was a kid i spent so much time in the woods yeah you know and the years go by and you say to yourself, 
Oh, and I, even even I would go camping with my friends, you know, just crazy teenage camping out in the woods and, yeah. you know, hanging out. But then nothing happened, you know, for so many years. Brought my sons uh, to some overnight camping in a campground setting, yeah. you know, yeah. with my wife. But then, you know, then I said, you know, I'd like to get, you know, people talk about getting out and going up to the whites uh, and so i did that i'm in connecticut and that was oh, close by the whites are not easy though are they i mean really there's that's no, a t- no. tough place and, and also you're kind of spoiled because it's so darn beautiful up there it's one of the most beautiful parts of the whole appalachian trail in my view absolutely absolutely i went i went up um to mizpah on crawford notch trail which isn't on the at but it's yeah. It's the it's the direct trail up to the Miz, up to Mizpah, and um, it's three miles. I was whipped. I was just so <laughs> I was so out of shape and such. So before I uh, I the next year I believe it's hard to remember it all, but the next year I did the did the long trail, and yeah. that I just got geared up for, and um, had a great had a great time because. The first hundred miles of the long trail, if you're going from south to north, which most people do, sure. the first hundred miles is shared with the Appalachian Trail. That's and right. I did it um I did it in July, which is when a lot of through hikers are coming through. A lot yeah. of uh AT through hikers. So I had done my research well, you know, like you and you've mentioned, you know, you did all your research what what to buy, what to what to have. And yes. I did that, but they seriously, they showed me how to use it. Uh, it it's, it was so oh, cool. How interesting. The way they, how interesting. You know, you can have the great stuff, you can have the great stuff, but you need somebody to show you how to use it just to go out in the woods by yourself. It was, it was wonderful. Show me how to repack, show me what to send home. <laughs> the whole thing. Yeah. So what do you think you learned from them? What do you think you learned from them? Less is more, I presume. Oh, of course. I had, I was pretty good about making it lightweight. And it, it was 2004. And I think about two years before that is when the, the weight or when I look back, um, you know, research since then, around 2000 sure. to 2004 was when, you know, Golight had come through and com- uh, companies like that that really plunged the weight down. Yeah. And I had a, some good advice from somebody at, uh, at, at a gear shop um and he 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 showed me how to really lower the weight just it's amazing what what a half an hour with the right person you know how much of a difference that makes yeah. and then i went back and did it on my own and you know back then when it was hard to go online and hard to download things and find things it yeah. it was it was uh it was great but it, there was nothing like the through hikers that had already come all the way up they just eased my mind, and you know they gave you that vibe of yeah you'll you'll land on your feet you know just do this and oh man you have trouble with that okay fix it you know it's stuff <laughs> like that you know was there a big takeaway was there one particular thing you thought oh I should have realized that or or was it just general little incremental items then in? yeah small stuff but yeah. uh, repacking the pack. After, you know, having having a guy who was holed up in a shelter uh, with uh, Lyme disease, you know, he was only able to do like three or four miles and he was used oh, to doing geez. 25. Yeah, so he, yeah. he hung out with me one afternoon and showed me a whole bunch of things. His name was Flippy. Uh, I remember <laughs> that. I guess he was flipping. Uh, I had no idea at that point. But then yes. um, and then I also had some trouble with um, with water. uh that somebody helped me with but uh, you know more more precise more um actually more important was just the, that feeling of you know everything doesn't have to be perfectly planned you know it's just, yes oh absolutely just absolutely. just fall and you know get up and keep going and stop when you need to and just just the fact that they were going to be nice people you know i mean that these were not going to be a bunch of macho crazies that wanted to you know be little me because i wasn't able to do big miles and things yeah. you know so so what was your pack weight when you actually did the long trail there once you'd been had these conversations oh on the long trail back in 2004 
I, as I said, I made some good decisions. I yeah. got a tarp tent that was only two pounds. You know, uh-huh. I yeah. had a, um, it was 35 pounds. Huh? And, that's, you know, that's, with, uh, that's what I ended with, with food. I, I ended with 35 pounds as well with food. And it still seems heavy compared to what I hear these days. I mean, it's just amazing to me. So you got out there, you learned how to use your equipment, and you started. You then started doing the AT in sections. So how much have you done so far of the AT as a section hiker? Well, on my last trip, which was actually in 2016, I, I, in the summer, I did southern Maine, and I, I got to the point where I'm over the halfway mark. I mean, just nice. barely, maybe 20 miles, 30 miles. I, I really should check it all out, add it all up. It's kind of crazy because that's something I would probably do, but <laughs> <laughs> but I haven't done it. And now I'm going back out next week, so uh, you know, All right, add where, some more to that. Which section are you doing next week? Well, I'm picking up uh, about a mile north of Skyland in the northern Shenandoahs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, mile nine thirty three point four is where I left <laughs> off back uh, in 2016 when I did 400 miles. Uh, yeah. I came up from the south and did uh, from Marion. There was a bus stop in Marion, and uh-huh. then I uh, made my way up. I did 400 miles and then ran off to Trail Days. So that was nine nine thirty three point four. So that's where I'm starting. <laughs> you, you get these. That's the thing about the section hiker. You know, you have to you have to figure it all out from where you've been. If you're yeah. obsessive like me, you know, <laughs> it's a different, you mi- it's sure. a different mindset. It's definitely a different mindset. So what do you think the, the pros and cons are then of section hiking? To me, the biggest con of all uh, for me would be starting every time to try to get your trail legs, but you just said you went 400 miles. So you do get your trail legs obviously within that period of time. What do you, when you look at these things, what do you think? Well, I've really spun around on that. When I started doing this, I mean, we're talking, I'm 64, I yeah. think like you, right? Aren't you? 60? I'm 65. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you're, you're a youngster. You're yeah, a you're 35. Than me. I'm sorry. I'm, sorry. I'm 65. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, oh, you're 65. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm <laughs> like you said, you're 35. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I try that too sometimes. No. Um, yeah. What happens is when I got started, I was a bit obsessed about the fact that I had to go through so much to get myself in shape before I would begin. Mm. And then I just turned around on that. And I realized that I've never been a person to do exercise, you know, to go to the gym and stay with a regimen. I have a son who does that, you know, a big bodybuilder type and all that. And, you know, mm. he, he's great. It's wonderful. He's got so much discipline. Never saw that when he was a kid, but that, that's another story. Anyway. So, <laughs> He'll appreciate um, that. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I, it gets me to exercise. It has, it really changes my life. It makes me have a reason. And I'm not talking big exercise. I'm talking about going out and walking the dogs for three miles, sure. doing, sure. Uh, getting on the treadmill every day, getting ready. So here's here, the, the, the con just turned into a pro. You know what I mean? Like the, yeah, I do, the, yeah. the liability the liability has now become an asset. You know, yes. I'm getting in better shape and in my real life, in my street life, you know, not just on the trail. So I, I, I guess, you know, after doing this for what is it, 14, I don't know, 10 years, 12 years, you know, the thing to think about is how it does, you know, ultimately it should enhance your life. And now in being a, um, being a section hiker kind of does. And I, I, I'm almost, I'm, of course, there's nothing like that, you know, that straight ahead. There are certain things about being a through hiker, but being a section hiker, I feel like it's been more of my life than possibly it would have been as a through, you know? Wow. How interesting. You know, and the other, the other aspect of it is I, I really had no control. I was a teacher and I didn't want to leave my career. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And, um, And so I didn't have the time and not only that, but I had issues with feet and other things outside. So I went for a period of about six, seven years, five or six years where I wasn't getting on the trail, even though I tried to every year, I just didn't, you know, life took over, but I mean, it's just funny because I used to get really frustrated with that. And then I kind of flipped it around. It's, 
it's now I, I say to myself, wow, if I could just get three weeks a year or something like that, you know, then it will help me stay in shape. Well, there's no question that, you know, there are section hiking is so popular. There are so many more section hikers than through hikers, obviously. And they are, they're very fervent about it as well. And I can see it because ours is, uh, no, the through hiker, it's a real, it's a one hit thing, isn't it? With it, with you guys, as you say, you're going back there every year and really getting into it. The thing for me was always the preparation in terms of trying to get back in shape. But if you're, so you're t- intentionally working out or t- trying to get yourself you know, uh, slightly fit, ready, to, ready to start two or three months in advance of a of a section hike. Slightly, you know, I'm not. As I said, I'm not the kind of guy who shows up at the gym and no. does it that way. So it's slight. It's with me. It's dogs. You know, walking the dogs, but giving them a good walk. You know, because yeah. I'm going to be going on a trip. You know, yeah. and and it gets me centered. It gets me to think about it more, and that's kind of that's good. So it's really helping my general fitness, you know, whereas otherwise, um, and the, the other thing that I have really found now, this is only because it's the years have gone by and now I'm older, but <laughs> when I get out, I'm, I'm like six, seven, eight miles for the first week and a half. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, I stay with that. Uh, it was a joke back in 2016. There was a through hiker named Packy from um, Germany. He was great. And he was like, I said, he said, so what did you do to throw me stick? And I say, <laughs> I say, oh, I did five miles today. And he says, five miles. I must laugh, you know, <laughs> and then we just had a fun time with that, you know, it, it, but then I, but then I saw him further down the line, you know, I mean, I kind of caught up with him. Wow. He had to stop. He had to, you know how that is. He had to stop, get off for boots or something. But do you enjoy that part of it? Do you enjoy the, so you're walking slowly, deliberately, or you're walking with a lot of rests, or you're just, you set out yourself an ambition to not push yourself too too much too early. What's the what's the rationale behind? Yeah, doing, all of those, that? all right. of those. But I tend to walk, and I'm, you no, know, it's kind of a drag in a way because you get to a campsite at like three o'clock, and you intentionally have to stop. You know, I mean, yeah. Yeah. you but but i'm worried i have some plantar fasciitis and things like that that i have that oh. can click in and so i really it for that trip that 400 mile trip the first few days i i really did keep myself to five miles it, it, it sounds oh. absurd you know but that's what i did and i'm so glad i did i i would sure. i would uh strongly recommend that everybody really keep that in mind i would think if there was one piece of information i could ever impart to anybody it was to go low but go low early in terms of miles i know my friend grizz talks about three to five miles a day for the first week or so and and to me that seems even lower but you know when you think about it so many people get off the trail because they go too hard to it too soon and just taking your time and getting yourself into it. And there's no doubt you also have to get a rhythm within the hike, don't you? Once you get moving, you can then start moving up to those more miles. But once you get stuck, when, when you're starting, you've really got to get into what hiking is because it's such a different thing to your everyday life, I found anyway. Oh, it, it, even if you've been in shape at a gym or something, it's different. I mean, it's, yes. yeah. it's the fact that you got so geared up before you went that you didn't sleep well. You know, I mean, I'm sorry. You know, I'm I'm starting to experience that now, and because yeah. I've been on seven or eight trips, I know enough to say, oh, okay, you're just being a jerk. You know, you're just getting so excited, <laughs> and you're not sleeping well. And then there'll be the train ride down next week when I go to Washington D.C. and then take a blah 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 and get the shuttle and blah, you yeah. know. And then finally, I'll be on the trail, and I'll wonder why I'm not eating well. I'll wonder why I'm not, you know, taking my food right. And, sure. um, and I'll, and if I'm not careful, I'll panic. And so that's what you're trying to avoid. Now at my age, I can do that. You know, yes. I can yeah. take the extra time. My, my nephew does, does he, he, he did the long trail a few years back and stuff. He's, he's a lawyer. He gets a weekend for three days. He's all excited. You know, he goes out to 15, 18 miles a day, but he's right around 30. You know, yeah, yeah. that's a Should different <laughs> time of life. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. He doesn't have the luxury of 
taking four days and being slow, you know. Uh, now, what I want to turn to now is your special skill. What actually is your special skill? And there's been a clue, obviously, from people <laughs> who, le- who heard the introduction. Tell us about that. Oh, well, I'm my background, I'm a musician uh, from way back. I was a music teacher for 39 years, taught in uh, schools, you know, uh, orchestra, yeah. band, those types of uh-huh. things. But when I'm on the trail, I actually bring uh, either a guitar or a, what they call a strum stick. Actually, both of them are called strum sticks. You know? uh-huh. And right. hence, yeah. the, hence the trail name, you know. Yeah, uh, strummy stick. That's yeah. where the, my, yeah, strummy stick is my trail name. And uh, yeah. <laughs> my, yeah. what, what happened was I was going to do the, the long trail. And um, I was at rehearsals for a group that I play in. And I said, geez, I'd like to do some music, bring it along. You know, I might bring a whistle or I might bring a um, harmonica. I got to yeah. keep it low. And then my friend Janet said, why don't you bring your drumstick? Come on, bring your drumstick so you can sing along and have a good time with it. And so she got me thinking and I did that. And then, you know, at the same rehearsal, we came up with the name Strummy Stick, you know, for the... <laughs> For a trail name and you know the whole thing. Yours is really ultra light, isn't it? The one you I, well, I, I, that's it. One of the links you yeah. sent me. Yeah, it's called a strum stick. They've been around in right just uh, traditionally, but the guy who really fixed it all up and got it going in in the eighties was a um, was a guy named uh, Bob McNally. And Bob uh-huh. McNally, Bob McNally, I think he's from either New York State or Vermont. He he came up with this three string guitar like thing. And, um, it, it's one pound. Seriously. When I put uh-huh. in extra strings and, and I yeah. have the, the case uh, that I bring and such, the whole kit that I bring is 18 ounces, you know, so uh-huh. that's one pound, two ounces. And uh-huh. that's for this three string thing. Um, and it, it, it's set up like a, um, uh, just got three strings. I think you uh-huh. might have heard a bit of that. And um, <laughs> it's a it's a D D A and then a high D. It's like a backwards mountain dulcimer, which is an Appalachian instrument, you know, a okay. traditional Appalachian instrument. Okay. And so uh, it's it it has that you know that banjo like sound and yeah, twangy. It's twangy, isn't it? It is. It is. It's that type of a sound. And so he took that design which was very, very small, very light. And he, he built it up into a guitar. And there's also a larger model, a guitar. Sometimes I bring that and sometimes, depending on the terrain I'm going on, it's nice to have the big, the full guitar, but it's, you know, sometimes I want the lighter weight, you know? So yes, the guitar yeah. is with the same setup, it's two and a half pounds. See, wow. so it's a yeah, pound a and difference. a half more. Yeah. And you did have your backpack modified, didn't you? <laughs> or uh, something added to your backpack to accommodate it, which is pretty cool. Tell us about that. Yeah, the only thing I did, um, it's, a, it's a standard backpack, and uh-huh. I've used several over the years. Um, sure. And the only I put it in a side pocket and have it suiting up so that it, it shoots up. The top of it goes over, goes sticks up. Yeah, and, sure. then, um, and it just sits outside the pack in its own little bag with bubble wrap (laughs) and they're amazingly strong they're the the, the design is like kind of a one-piece design that's hollowed out you know sort of like a canoe or something what's it made of it's wood it's pretty much an engineering marvel if you ask me because the way he took the guitar and modified it into this shape and you know they're backpacking guitars so anyway he sold his design to martin and now Martin, you know, Martin Guitar Company builds them and calls they're the backpacker, the Martin backpacker. But oh, Bob nice. McNally designed that, you know. Cool. So. so tell us about, and, and I know you've, you've taken groups, groups out there. Tell us about the Fiddle Hike school trip because that's something which intrigued me. Oh, well. yeah. Yeah. As I said, I was a school teacher. I'm recently retired since 2012. But sure. before that, I was a... Um, a, a, an orchestra director in a middle school. I did, uh, you know, the, the stringed instruments primarily 
for the last, say, 25 years. Sure. Did a bunch of different things. Oh, did a lot of band stuff, too. But at any rate, I had a fiddle group. And when I finished doing a section up in New Hampshire, I was on my way home, and I'm in the car, and I, you know, you get these ideas, especially... I was just driving along and I said, you know, I got to make this something the kids can do too. Because kids who play instruments like me, um, at some point in their life, they ended up just in a room with the instrument. They spend almost too much time in an indoor environment, you know. Sure. And, and I love these adventures. So I just kind of said, I got to find a way to do it. So I took my fiddle group, which does traditional country music and country fiddling and i play guitar back up to them and i and i took them up to the whites i i made a bunch of phone calls and we do what we call a fiddle hike <laughs> and we go up and, and we stay a friday night at at highland center right there in crawford notch uh -huh. and then we um i drive the bus i got a special license so i can drive a small bus Mm -hmm. And so I've been doing that. We're, we're now, we're coming up to 2018, even though I've left the job, this still goes on. My, uh, you know, the person who took over for me, she, she really likes doing it too. And she's a fiddler herself, an excellent mm -hmm. fiddler. So, um, so we, we, we bring about 10 kids. We used to bring oh, 13, cool. but oh, they cool. made the buses smaller and yeah. it's great. We go, we play in the evening we play at the lodge and then on the next day we play at mount washington hotel cool. and um in the lobby and then we get on the trail and go up and stay in one of the huts how and nice is that I bet that's beautiful yeah so so you know that three mile thing that killed me back you know in 1998 <laughs> or whenever i did yeah. the kids <laughs> do that and it's wonderful you know these are these are your typical, you know, orchestra kids who, as I say, don't get out. Yes, and, exactly. And they, exactly. They, they eat it up. They, they eat it up. You know, they just love it. And um, there's a small, tiny section of maybe of, seriously, it's like less than a quarter mile. That that uh -huh. that is the Appalachian Trail. You know, right. there's a turn uh -huh. you make, and you're off the Crawford, and you're the turn right into Mispa is actually on the Appalachian Trail. So that's right. cool. And then we also do it other years. We have a three-year cycle. Has this made you, any of your kids want to actually do more hiking? Or is it just, is they this, do. Is, this their, yeah. is this their one thing that they get there? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I've heard from some of them that they've done more hiking since. Cool. You know, cool. they've become friends of mine on Facebook or something as sure. the years go on. I'm out of the school now, but think about it we've done this now for 12 years these people are young adults life takes over but some of them you know they they are hikers you know uh i've not heard of anybody who's like done the trail but when we finish that thing every year there's three or four of them are always saying oh someday you know i'm gonna do I bet. it so I you bet. never know you know because light and a spark is what what it actually is and and on a broader question do you think the arts has a role to play in the trail or is the trail just the trail where people just want to hike and get the miles out or do you think there's something you bring additional to the trail that might be you know a, a nice thing to have to develop in the future well i think it's it's tricky when you're out there of course the arts can augment life you know everywhere yeah, of course but it's tricky as to how you do it you it's so important not to be obnoxious about it now you had you mentioned you had a friend oh t totally you know you don't want to be that of course people go in and they think they have a god-given right to um to play their to play their uh their nice. ipod you know at full volume with yes, with, a, with yes. a sound system next to the shelter and i used to just be very very shy about it now i will say i think it's time for a song you know and i'll i'll play yeah, a cool. song and people pe Sometimes people will roll their eyes. I mean, not, I mean, I'm talking about, you know, like 
yeah, five sure. percent of the time. Somebody will you yeah. somebody will be like, Well, I came out to the woods, you know. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't really want to hear a guitar right now, but most of the time they they're very receptive. I would think so as well, because you know, you, especially if you're sitting around a campfire, how cool would that be? Just to someone to be able to play something. I always admire someone who can do that sort of thing. Um, you know, pick out yeah. a guitar and just play just at will, which is just extraordinary to me, and, and I love all that. So. But I understand you've got to be careful. You've got to be respectful of people's space and people's, you know, people's time, and and just you probably feel the moment is right or it's not right, don't you? Really, you do. And you know, as a musician who's worked over the years in many settings, like you know, restaurants and things, you begin to get a second sense of all that. You know, sure, you can sure. you can just feel the vibes of the people, and so you either back off or you don't. And yeah. um. And and sometimes I, there have been some wonderful times. I mean, there have been. Uh, uh, I mentioned that guy Packy, uh, the three German guys. Oh, they were they were hilarious. This one night at the shelter <laughs> back in, they wanted all hey, play some uh, John Denver. You know, you know, you know. They wanted they wanted all, and and they wanted the quintessential American classic. Absolutely. You know, rock and why, and why would they not? And yeah, why would they not? Why wouldn't they? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But the but, but it's funny the Americans are a little reticent to be that uh, predictable. They don't oh, they don't want to be that way. But to, the German guys were like, "Yeah, play some cowboy music," you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Now, you, you also you, you also in your email you mentioned the concept of adult play in your email. What what did you have in mind with that? Well, I've been thinking about that lately because now I'm older and I'm retired. And the old, what do you call it? The carrot and the stick, you know, it's yeah. not running anymore. It's like, I can do nothing. If I want to do nothing, I can do, I can be very efficient and get a lot done, whatever I want yeah. to do now. Yeah. So it's, a, it's a different thing. And I, I love the trail and I, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of people like the trail because they're no longer in that world that you're yes. just, you're, um, it's play. It's like when you were a kid. Uh, the uh, the back in the fall, I live pretty close to the trail now. We just moved here to Bethlehem, Connecticut, and I'm about mm-hmm. 45 minutes from the trail. And I went and kind of rescued a guy who was coming down in around Thanksgiving. This past Thanksgiving, he was soboing mm-hmm. and he was going south, and he came to Connecticut, and he was on. Facebook talking about how, you know, it's freezing and such. Sure. So I went and took him off and we had the greatest talk. His, his name is eager beaver and Great he name. brings <laughs> his ax and he stops along the trail and he just does trail maintenance. I mean, there's no reason why he does that other than he's enjoying the fact that he's, he has a role to play, sure. you know, and we take these trail names and we do this and we, it's we're just a bunch of kids, you know. It's, it's, <laughs> that's what I'm thinking about when I say that. The, the yeah, places, I, you know, I know, and I and I and I've got a I've got a funny feeling. A lot of our listeners are, in many ways, many of them in a slightly older demographic, and I think we all feel like we're playing when we're out there. I I. I've, I used to remember when I went above the tree line in in the White Mountains and things like that. I used to giggle out loud with excitement like a kid, you know, and it was just like being a just was literally like being a kid out in the woods, wouldn't it? I just, I just absolutely adored it out there. Yeah, people ask me, why do you, why do you need to go out there? Why, you know, why, why can't you just hike around your neighborhood and such? And I said, no, no, there's something about it. it just frees you. You're, yeah. you're, you're out there, and 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 the AT is wonderful because you're meeting up yeah. with people. And yeah. everybody's acting like <laughs> absolutely. It's a, it's a, and long may that continue as well. So you're off. You're off there ab- next week. Yeah. What, what, what's your area next week? What section are you going to do next week? Um, going from as I said, Shenandoah, uh, yeah. northern Shenandoah is heading north. How far? I, uh, you know, if I turn my ankle in two weeks, I'll be home. But if I right. if I get what I want out of this, uh, I'll be doing maybe say, uh, more than three hundred, maybe oh, four hundred nice. miles, um, going north you know up into uh, maryland pennsylvania that area you got a strum stick with you i've got I've, i haven't decided whether to get my whether to bring the guitar or the strum stick but i'm kind of going into a 
into an easier area. It's it's a little more, <laughs> relatively speaking. Right? Yeah, relatively. But yeah. um, yeah. but uh, you know, it's not the. I'm no longer. I'm not in Southern Maine like I was. No. A few years ago. <laughs> which, Very different. Yeah. Which, by Very by different. the way, it was my down, outright favorite place. I, I, yes, that was no. amazing. But at any rate, so I'll be going along. I might take the guitar and I might take the strum stick. Uh, cool. Still haven't Very decided. Cool. So. Well, look, I'm so glad you reached out and sent me the email. It was a lot of fun talking to you. And I, and I think, you know, uh, bringing a bit of music to the trail, how the how on earth could that really offend anybody quietly at night? And uh, and I just think it would be a lovely <laughs> lovely thing to sit around a fire and listen to you play uh, for a couple of minutes. But uh, it's really good of you come on. And uh, thanks very much. And let me know when you finish your 300 miles and love to find out how it went for you. Okay. Thank you so much, Mighty Blue. And I... I, I thank you for, for doing what you do. Uh, my, pleasure. my pleasure. Getting us all thinking about what we're, we're doing, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, all the best, then. Cheers. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Bye. I love the way that Mike turns what he originally regarded as a con of being a section hiker into a pro. Preparing for any section hike, and he does some pretty long sections, Mike just gets fitter. I thought it was great that he trusted in the AT through hikers he met while on the long trail to teach him little tricks of the trade and got him comfortable with his gear. Every week we seem to have stories of people helping other people on the trail and if you ever venture out there, you'll definitely know what I mean. I saw plenty of guitars on the trail in 2014, though I didn't often hear people play them. I think it would be delightful to be sitting around a glorious campfire wrapped up in all my winter gear freezing my ears off while the fire scorches my nose and listening to somebody like Mike who plays for the sheer joy of it. Listen to him at the end of the show when he puts his own spin on Wagon Wheel. I loved it. Before we get on to Jared Ross and the Lost Coast Trail, I can't say nothing about what happened last week. When I post a new show on a Thursday morning, I go to my Facebook page and add a link directly to the show on the Mighty Blue website. Then I had a few words. This is normally done at about four in the morning, so I'm not exactly the sharpest knife in the drawer at that time of day. Last week's episode with the Black Alaction, which was really well received by 99% of you, elicited such hate and vitriol online that, well, I just can't tell you. People seem to think that my few words were suggesting that black people can't get on the trail, or that they are in some way excluded from hiking. I meant nothing of the sort, and nothing could be further from the truth. And any of you who took the time to listen to the show would have understood that wasn't my intention in the slightest. I don't intend to relitigate the whole thing, but really, I hope that all my true listeners understood the place of love that the episode came from and weren't offended by anything that I said or wrote. I can tell you, Daniel wrote to me, and he loved the interview, so he was fine. Two last quick points. We've never had an episode fly past 2,000 downloads so quickly. (laughs) I don't know. I guess that's bad publicity. And I want to thank, from the bottom of my heart, those of you who took the time out of your day to not only listen to what I said and read what I wrote, but also to write to me the kindest, sweetest comments I think that I've ever received. My audience stepped up for me, and they, you, were, frankly, bloody marvellous. Thank you. Now it's time to have an adventure on the Lost Coast Trail with Jared Ross. Right, I'd like to introduce Jared Ross. Hi, Jared. How are you? Good, Steve. How are you? I'm good. And Jared is going to tell us about the Lost Coast Trail in California, which he's done. It's not desperately long, but it sounds a fascinating wild, uh, (laughs) wild hike to do. So, why did you do this particular trail, and what what drew you to it? Well, there's there's a couple things. The first was that we were wrapping up a season working in Yellowstone National Park, right. and we had a trip planned there with some friends and coworkers that would be about a week, and um, we got snowed out. I mean, the weather in Yellowstone is pretty unpredictable, especially in the fall. So we started looking for something that would be a little bit more friendly. And this Lost Coast Trail had come up on our radar because I have some family in that area. Okay. So we'd been talking about it for about a year, and then this just seemed like a good opportunity. We had a group of hikers that were prepared to do a week-long backpacking trip, 
Right. And uh, the timing just worked out that we decided to move the, the hike to California. All right. Uh, so it's a, not a long hike. It says it t- takes about three to four days to do. What is the most challenging part about this hike? Because I think I can see what it must be. But uh, what, what do you think the most challenging part <laughs> of it was? Well, the, that's the northern section. So the, the part that most people do is the northern part. It's about 30 miles long. Right. And it's right along the beach. So you're, you're hiking through sand. Oh. which for anyone who's walked along a sand dune um, without a 30-pound pack on your back, you can imagine what that feels like. I can. <laughs> <laughs> and was it as tough as it seems to be? Yeah, it was. I mean, the good thing is, so I grew up a, along the coast in Massachusetts, so I'm yeah. familiar with the beach. I knew what it's like to walk on the sand. Yeah. Um, so, so combining that with hiking, I kind of knew what to expect. Right. And, and it was just that, but it was a challenge. <laughs> and a dog's allowed because people love going on the beach with their dogs but a 25 mile dog walk might be a bit too long yeah um i'm not a hundred percent sure on the northern section because so to backtrack a little bit um what you were referring to when you said that people usually hike it in about three days is the northern part so the entire lost coast trail is about 60 miles oh, and that I'm includes looking, the yeah, southern part now. as managed by um, a california state park Right. So if you do it in, which is what we did, we started in the Southern section and did the part through the Sinkyone wilderness, um, state park right. that's managed by California. And then you come to a little town called shelter Cove, and then you go into the Northern section, which is the part that most people do. And that's the part that there's a little bit more literature and information on, but, um, the Southern section is just absolutely spectacular. I, Almost everyone that was with us really agreed that the the scenery and the hiking in the southern part was just phenomenal. And how accessible is it? How easy is it to get to? Well, it's called the Lost Coast for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a clue um, in the title. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a very uh, – um, you have to do a lot of preparation and planning to get out there. Really? The, um, the, the name Lost Coast comes from a stretch – along the California mountain range, um, in Northern California, that was so difficult to develop that when they were constructing the California scenic highway, uh-huh. um, route one that runs right along the coast for most yeah. of the state and up into Oregon, they had to bump it inland for uh-huh. this 60 mile stretch where there was just no way to build roads the way that they had been. So the good news for us is that it preserved this huge swath of wilderness that's that's there the way that you know the California coast really was um, nice. historically. So being able to access that and do that is, is just really a fluke, and that's where the name the Lost Coast comes from. Now, even today, getting out there is a struggle. Uh, <laughs> it's about four hours north of San Francisco, right? And yeah. actually, the week that we did it, we had to take an eight-hour by car detour because uh, mudslides had washed out roads. Wow! Is it a dangerous hike? Um, the, the hike itself is pretty comparable to a lot of hiking that we've done, whether it's, uh, in Yellowstone or a little bit out in the East. So there's not a lot of danger as far as, you know, the typical hiking things you have to be concerned about, whether it's water accessibility or being up and down mountains or hillsides. Sure. But there are a couple of unique features out there. One is because of the isolation, if something happens, um, you're really out kind of in the middle of nowhere. I would think. Is there, yeah. any cell, is there any cell service at all? I guess there's not, is there? We had some when we were closer to that town of Shelter Cove. All right. Yeah. But it was very, very spotty. Right. Um, and it's not something I would rely on at all. And then the second thing that is really unique to that hike is when you are hiking the northern section, you are hiking on the coast and you have to be aware that there's two stretches where the tide washes out the trail completely. That's helpful. Um, (laughs) Oh my gosh. I don't like the sound of that at all. (laughs) (laughs) It sounds more intimidating than it is because the two large ones are both It sounds pretty pretty damn intimidating to me, I tell you. (laughs) (laughs) It's just, it's like anything, it's, it's any of the risks you, you do when you do a long hike is you have to just have the knowledge and the preparation to do it. And um, these two stretches were about four miles. Right. So if you're thinking about, you know, any kind of hiking you do, 
you have basically an eight hour window where this path is accessible. All right. And that's, you know, giving you about a half a mile an hour of pace to get through it safely. That being said, when people get into trouble is when they start out hiking it when they shouldn't. If you're looking at your watch and you're realizing that, oh, you only have two hours to do this stretch, you know, anything could happen. You're hiking on tough terrain and going through sand and climbing over rocks and you just can't risk it. So as long as you plan accordingly, you have plenty of time to do a, a relatively short distance. So half, half a mile an hour is pretty slow going. Is that because it's so darn tough? Oh, it's not the rate that you're actually going. I'm just saying that for oh, it, it to really it allows you to yes. do those okay. four miles. Yes. Correct. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's not really a, 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 a trial for beginners necessarily then, is it? No, it's, it's definitely not one for your first backpacking trip. Um, you want to have a structure as far as like your own personal preparation, yeah. knowing how your pack is, knowing your abilities, because um, it's a trail that will test you. Yeah, I'm sure. For sure. And what about and what about camping? Are there campsites or is it so wild you just camp where you can? No, there's a good amount of campsites. And like I said, the northern part is very popular. So right. there's pretty established campgrounds um, along the way where there's fire rings and that sort of thing. And the southern section, um, it comes in and out of meeting with mountain roads. So there's even some drive-up campgrounds that you wind oh, nice. up using. Uh, one of the spots where we camped in the southern section, there was actually an old historic uh, ranch house that had been converted to a visitor center and a converted barn that was uh, used as a shelter. Right. So there's definitely some infrastructure there. It's not any roads that I would want to take my car down, but <laughs> if you grew up there yeah. and you're familiar with the mountain driving, then there's there's nothing wrong with it. So when's a good time to do this trip then? Uh, I'm looking at the, I'm looking online and uh, we should trust online <laughs> as far as we could throw it um uh it says when to go late may through early october usually has the best weather Is it, when did you go we were in there uh in the early fall so around that time of uh early october and we were cutting it a little bit close because right. that area of the country has a dry season and a wet season and you don't want to be out there in the in the rainy season I would think um, you which don't. is when you have a lot of road issues and that sort yeah. of thing yeah. So we got out there at the tail end of the season and the weather was gorgeous. I mean, right. we had some really beautiful days. Uh, I think we only had one day of rain uh, and that was towards the end. So we were lucky, but I think, you know, that time window sounds fair. Right. And it says here that all hikers required to ca carry at least one approved bear canister per person. So is bear activity quite large there? Uh, one of our friends did see a bear, a black bear on trail. And, you know, it, it's the same as hiking in the East. They, they kind of look at you and scurry away. But it's really a matter of protecting your food at night when you're away from it and making sure that they're not able to get into it. There's not a lot of um, tree areas where you could hang food. And they're so used to people in that area because there are a lot of um, residents in the mountains out there right. that sure. they'll go looking in, in packs and things that you, you know, might have not had uh, bears going through in previous Hikes. Sounds very exotic, doesn't it? The Lost Coast Trail. It sounds uh, <laughs> sounds kind of kind of wonderful, but I can see why it's lost, though. <laughs> it is. If you Google images for it, it it will definitely stir uh, some some desire to go see it because it was just some of the most spectacular views. Um, you know, like I said, I grew up on the ocean, so being able to combine mountains and ocean views in the same hike was just something so special. I'm sure it was. I mean, it was spectacular, yeah. Very nice. Well, thanks for telling us about that. But uh, there's something else I wanted to talk to you about because you and I have been speaking recently um, about podcasting, and you've got a, a podcast idea in mind. Would you like to just quickly tell people what that's about? Absolutely. As I kind of mentioned earlier in the, in the interview, um, We've spent the last two years living and working in Yellowstone National Park, mm -hmm. and that has kind of been a foundation of um, my fiance Sarah and I kind of shifting our life into this non-traditional way of living in an RV and traveling mm -hmm. the country and really kind of putting traveling and experiencing nature and different uh, outlets first. Sure. So we're planning on starting a podcast called Wanderers: Life on the Road, where we're going to be using those past two years of experience and meeting people who are doing the same thing we are 
uh, into living this kind of non-traditional way and talking with them and seeing how they do it and how they manage to kind of get away from the nine to five. Yeah, <laughs> like nine to five for doing podcasts. <laughs> which is what I do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm working all day doing podcasts. <laughs> but I love the idea of doing stuff on the road. It'd be really cool. So when do you think that first episode will be out, just so I can let people know on the show? Or will you just drop me a line when it's when it's out? I'll definitely reach out to you when it's ready. My goal right now is um, the June 1st, I think. I know June I had 1st. mentioned late May, but I think June 1st is a good solid day. You've got something else to do in May, though, haven't you? Yes, I, I did say fiancé earlier. We're getting married in the end of May. So when I said late May to her, she kind of looked at me yeah. with wide eyes. I, I think maybe June. Yeah, <laughs> quite right. Listen to management straight away. Okay, well, thanks so much yeah. for sh- sharing this with us. And as soon as uh, we know about it, we'll just let people know uh, with an announcement on the show. Okay? Yeah, excellent. Thank you. And thanks for taking the time to talk to me. Nice to talk to you. Bye. Take it easy. Speak to you soon. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. Wow, what a trial that sounds like. It really earns its name, doesn't it? It's so inaccessible and you've really got to want to hike it. And the trail washes away every day for about four miles. Awesome. I thought Jared's podcast sounded pretty cool as well, so I'll be letting you know when that hits iTunes. Chapter three of my book is about the somewhat limited culinary choices on the trail. I apologise for my rather hoarse voice. It's all part of the pulmonary embolism that's still clearing up in me. Every now and then I sound like Joe Cocker with a sore throat. Don't forget to hang around at the end of this short chapter as we're going to end the show with Strummy Stick once more. I'll see you next week. Chapter 3. Food Food is another critical component to consider when planning this trip. While I had no illusions that I was going to have copious opportunities to indulge in fine dining, hikers have a couple of choices in their pursuit of sustenance. First, you can buy food as you go. The trail regularly crosses roads, with locals often happy to provide lifts into town. Having last hitched a ride in 1974 to Scotland for a soccer match, I was a little bit rusty with my technique. I'd assumed that it would be difficult to get somebody to stop for a smelly hobo by the side of the road. I was wrong. Most of the towns which are linked by roads on the trail are fairly small. Locals understand the importance of providing help in getting customers to spend their money in these towns. I found it simple to stick out my thumb, smile like a demented fool and bring a truck to a halt. I'm sure that the pathetic loser look that I skillfully developed didn't hurt my cause either. The advantage in supplying from home is that you can have precisely what you want. My wife Diane was a wonderful supplier. We would speak almost every day and when I was running low on food... I would identify a town that was, say, 60 miles ahead of me. I'd then ask her to send me a package to the local post office. When I first considered this, it seemed fraught with opportunities to go wrong. However, it worked like a dream. I discovered an excellent website that allowed Diane to print a sheet of address labels that corresponded with all the post offices on the trail. The link is at www.sophianose.com. S-O-P-H-I-A-K-N-O-W-S dot com. The site is also useful for accurate weather forecasts at the shelters, as well as a bunch of other stuff that will help you. Not once did this system fail me, though it's important to know the opening and closing times of post offices. Hoping for a pickup on a Saturday and then arriving, say, after one o'clock, condemns you to stay until Monday morning. None of this is rocket science, so a little attention is all that's required. Once you have your labels, you're good to go. I used a combination of resupply from home and local shopping. This was especially so when I went into some of the larger towns. By the time the legendary hiker hunger hit me, I could go into town and eat like a condemned man in a local restaurant, then cram a few little extras into my backpack. You'll notice that my earlier tie into bear grills is starting to fade away. While bugs and grubs are doubtless full of nutrients and proteins, you can't beat a burger and fries washed down with a couple of cold beers. I soon learned that the dollar store is the hiker's favourite store and Walmart was an unexpected treat. The great thing about the dollar store, from my perspective, was that I could buy Snickers bars at ridiculously cheap prices. Some of the sell-by dates were perilously close, but I developed such an overwhelming habit for these chocolate bars that I was devouring up to six a day towards the end. Ramen noodles, oatmeal and assorted pasta and rice meals were also available at the dollar store at bargain basement prices there was a perverse pride to be had in paying, say, 30 cents for an entire meal. Those who chose this option could definitely avoid packages from home if they didn't have their own Diane. 
Once more, some forward planning was necessary to ensure that you weren't facing a three-day hike with only one pack of noodles in your food bag. It shocked me in the early days how hungry hiking would make me. Indeed, I was losing weight at an alarming pace within weeks, despite eating until I felt full. By the end, however, I slipped into that wonderful state of being that allowed me to eat, literally, enough food for a family of four and not put on a pound in weight. The magical effects of this guilt-free eating lasted for the whole trip. Unfortunately, those effects came to an abrupt halt on my return to civilization. The renewed accumulation of poundage sadly resumed soon after. The great bonus with regard to eating on the trail is that there are no bad choices. If you want to spread Nutella on your wrap, then smear a good helping of peanut butter on top of the Nutella, go ahead and do it. If you think that adding a pair of Snickers bars and a pair of Butterfingers bars will add a touch of class to the whole ensemble, then you should certainly do that as well. Nobody's going to judge you for your attempt to find some variety on the trail. That particular little concoction, prepared lovingly by my friend Muffin Man, appeared one day at a shelter and nobody questioned the sanity of the perpetrator. There were even nods of approval, and I could tell that this appetising confection was soon going to be repeated somewhere else a few miles down the line. I often saw interesting culinary choices. One of the easiest ways to add calories was to carry some olive oil and add a slug to well, just about anything that you ate. Oil was obviously added to pasta and rice, and I also saw it in oatmeal and even in coffee. One morning, I added peanut butter to my oatmeal, along with a slug of olive oil. The resulting sludge was predictably dreadful. Fortunately, the disgusting taste soon passed, so I was calorically enhanced and ready for my day. Ramen noodles probably appear in more food bags than any other item. They're cheap, they have powdered flavouring, and they can be supplemented by several other things. Tuna or chicken pieces, shredded cheese and salami end up in these noodles. A number of the more innovative youngsters would empty their pockets at the end of the day, revealing pickings they had discovered by the side of the path. Given that most men would simply urinate to the side while standing on the path, I was often wary of the provenance of these wild herbs. I suppose the point of this section is that there is virtually nothing that a hiker will not eat given the chance. Experiment and you'll find your own version of the Snickers and Butterfingers wrap. You'll be surprised at how inventive, how disgusting you will become. Once you've mastered this undomesticated living, though, you can leave the grubs and bugs to bear. He apparently loves them. Some folks want to live in mansions grand, but I was born to love the wild woods and walk across the land, over mountains, through valleys, in the wind and hail, to rock with bugger along the Appalachian Trail. It's a couple thousand miles from Georgia to Maine. You can through hike, flip, flop, and walk it all the same. You can section hike, slap pack, any way you like. Just get off of that couch. Rocking back and forth 
with a pain in my gut But there's an angel up ahead Where the trail meets the road Giving me the magic that'll help me bear the load I found a few friends We said we'd hike it on through We back the white places But we stopped for the views We stayed away from yellow Threw away the green We was a huffing, puffing train We was a walking machine I looked for some love Rock me, mama, like the wind and the rain. Rock me, 